this podcast episode has just been us trying to establish our authority and convince ourselves that we are an authority. No, I'm just kidding. Totally joking. <laughs> totally joking. Like cooking, everything has a recipe. A set of instructions to follow in order to gain a certain result. Music is no different. Be it ingredients for a dish, a set list for an amazing show, or a release strategy for a successful launch. These are all recipes. Hi, we're your hosts, Sean. And I'm Brandon. Come and join us in our kitchen as we go through the Music Makers Cookbook. Let's get cooking. Welcome to the Music Makers Cookbook, the podcast where we help independent artists cook up recipes for success in the music industry. I'm Sean. And I'm Brandon. And we are complete authorities on how to make it in the music industry, we are great for artist development, do everything we say to do because we look the part, we dress the part, we say the part, and by all, by gosh darn it, fuck it, we're doing it. <laughs> Damn, I mean, and we're doing it remotely today. I, this is a little bit different of a setup for us. And all honesty, we probably could have met up today to do this episode, but we had kind of talked about this before, just in case we ever get into a situation where we need to be remote, we're going to test mm-hmm. it out with this specific situation today. So, but I think that, I think you just determined yourself as either in authority or in authority. Didn't you, Sean? Didn't you just say that in, in the beginning? Yes, yes, I did. And then, which is a good way to bring it up because we're we'll be talking about being in authority and how authoritative figures can influence you to do things. Yeah. I got a question for you, Sean. You do? Okay. Do you like, yeah. Do you like authority? No, I want to rage against the machine. Your, an- your anarchy all the way. I knew it. I knew deep down inside you were. I knew it. No, I think for certain things, uh, which is... Yeah, agreed. It it really depends on more so how the person's presenting themselves, if they're trying to lean in on their authority to do something, and also, like, what is it? Like, if someone's talking Mm -hmm. to me about global warming or vaccines or shit like that, and, you know, they're a scientist with PhDs, with graduated from wherever and have been in the field for 20 years and they have all this information and scientific studies that back up their point of view. It's like, yeah, you're an authority. I'm going to trust you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause it's not like we're going to go out and do the research ourselves. Right. There's no way. I mean, we wouldn't have the time to research everything in the world. Like we have to take sometimes people, people's words and their credentials, you know, and be able to make decisions on a click run basis, mm-hmm. you know, that help us in the long run and the long run of things. I mean, I think that's like one of the biggest parts about authority personally for me. I mean, you and I were self-employed, so like, there has to be something within us that's like slightly not accepting of authority at some point. There's there's some kind of oh, like some kind of spot along the way where we're just like maybe like ah no thanks we'll just do it ourselves right and maybe that's from prior experience or whatever. I know for me it's definitely from prior experience. Just with like you said like the minuscule tasks that don't amount to like very high stakes situations like a vaccine or. What was the other one that you used? The global warming or something like that, right? I'm talking about like a little bit smaller things, maybe not insignificant, but smaller things where power is bestowed upon you by somebody that just wants to bestow power because they have the authority to do so. I think Mm -hmm. that's where mine kind of comes from. Yeah. Well, also, also, (laughs) we're in the music industry. The whole music industry is kind of like against authority. That's that's the yeah. grunge movement, the punk movement, the rock and roll movement, mm-hmm. the hip hop movement. Like pick a genre yeah. and, and say, and it is probably against authority in one way or another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Almost um, guaranteed. Almost guaranteed. That's almost the backbone of music. Pretty much. Yeah. Taking it back to the basis of, of what authority is and how prevalent it is in our society and why it's such a click run response is that like all these things we've talked about, it's been historically and biologically imperative for our survival as a species. I mean, if you look at groups of cultures all around the world, there's always some sort of authority that is the figurehead of how it functions there, whether it be a tribe and there's a chief mm-hmm. or whether it be a, a city and there's a mayor or there be a country and there's a president, whatever it may be, or even like a classroom and a teacher or a group project and the leader. I, you can get three people. Someone's going to be the one that needs to take initiative to, that you report back to or whatnot. I mean, we're both audio yeah. engineers. We always want to have the one point of contact whenever we do revisions mm-hmm. for the mix. So we know, hey, this is the person we're going to that has all the feedback revisions that we're getting the final say of. And they're the authority in this band. That's just kind of how it goes. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And typically those are the people that are best at communication, being able to communicate and explain things in a way that would circumvent to more productivity in the long long run of things. Mm -hmm. Maybe the most emotionally connected to as well, where they're emotionally intelligent, the wisest maybe person, and maybe even the most powerful person. Maybe they're they're the leader of the band. You know, maybe they oversee the entire band Mm -hmm. itself, right? Um, I think that's why we generally like to gravitate towards those things. And like these things that I just said do make up the traits of a good authority figure. Yeah. Um, These are not inherent, though. They're definitely not inherent. And we'll kind of talk about that maybe in a few bullet points in the future. So these definitely come with stipulations. These are more earned titles and that are demonstrated over maybe a course of period of time. Mm -hmm. And that period of time can depend on how long you know the person. If you have just started working with somebody and you've had great conversations for two hours and maybe you're more inclined, right? Or maybe you know, you've known somebody for a decade and, and you can trust them and, and put your sub- subordinate, like, oh. I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know how, you, you know what I'm trying to say. I, I know like what you're trying to say, yeah. trust in them. Yeah. Yeah. Cause whatever I was about to say just was about to sound just really bad. So <laughs> I'm just trying, I'm just trying not to make it sound terrible. You're good, man. Well, I'm just going to kind of jump ahead to something that you wrote in our notes is that really being an authority relies to two main things and Mm -hmm. that would be expertise and trustworthiness. If you have faith that someone will do it and also you believe that they will do it, not that they just have the skill, but also they have the character traits of someone who will follow through that builds up them as a sense of authority where it's like, yep, Mm -hmm. they're going to do what they say they're going to do. They're going to bring everyone together, cause us to do this, get us in the right direction, get shit done. That's the two things that, build a authority Mm. or someone with authority and yeah we kind of the part where it becomes click run are the ways that we can visually learn these traits about somebody to make the decision real quickly of oh should i trust this person and will they do what they say Uh, you wrote down Mm. such things as like titles like labels describing the profession or the credentials so like doctor phd things like that like oh this person has these credentials they probably know what they're doing we'll talk more Mm -hmm. about it in the end because like all of these in this series we used to go theory up front and then we apply it to music and later on but like grammy winners that's a credential here like oh this person this must be a great best great band because they have they won a grammy or this must be a good recording studio because the engineer has a couple of grammys other than that like clothing if a doctor is wearing a lab coat or a doctor's Mm -hmm. jacket or whatever or a nurse is wearing scrubs or whatnot. Medical profession is one of the easiest ways to talk about authority because it is, it is as a whole, a lot of us kind of default to the authority in these situations mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to our health. But yeah, clothing is a huge one. You mentioned that it can be faked, which we'll dive more yes. into later yeah. on. But then like the last thing, and I'll, I'll let you kind of dive more into it, but I want to cover the last one is trapping. So like accessories and possessions that demonstrate social status or wealth. In the book, he talks about how we perceive people that have wealth as just being larger authority figures, even if it doesn't Mm -hmm. really relate to what they're even talking about. One of the examples that he gives is in uh, New York, they had someone dress up in a full business suit, like he was like an investment baker or something, and he just walked across the street, even though there wasn't a green light to walk, and a lot of pedestrians Mm -hmm. would follow him. Uh, Even though being an investment banker has nothing to do with knowing whether or not you can cross Mm -hmm. the road because he looks like he's in an expensive suit and has wealth. It's like, oh, he must know what he's doing because he has Mm -hmm. these things. And there's a lot of genres that take advantage of that and showcase it very heavily in photos, promotional materials, music videos, things like that. I kind of want to make a quick differential between you bringing up being an authority and how Sean says that and how we're saying that right now is a n an authority. Dr. Cialdini talks about there's two different ways to be in authority or in authority, in I N in authority mm-hmm. and authority definitely comes with a more less backed title. Maybe you were put there because you got a raise because somebody left at your job or in some, they needed somebody to step in. Right. Or maybe it was just just a pure title sake, just because it's just a formality at the workplace or whatever the case may be, right? This doesn't come with a lot of backing and it doesn't come with a lot of that expertise or trustworthiness some of the times, you know, to be able to earn the trust of your peers, right? So there are two different ways to kind of being in authority and an authority. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about more being an authority, but I'm not saying that being in authority can't be effective still. And Dr. Cheldini talks about that in the book a little bit. 
But moving, moving more into the music and the audio industry, we see authority figures all over. And usually these are the people that we're trying to impress, trying to network with. That is just inherently who we gravitate towards because we know that they have a repertoire of either people behind them, credentials behind them, success stories, whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. And plus, they might just be cool people in the long, long run, whether they showcase it through their clothing, through their trappings, whatever. Well, real quick, before we go through that list, yeah, go ahead. kind of mm -hmm. talking about before you go through this, most of these really highlight that difference that Brandon just talked about being in authority versus being an authority because everyone we're about to list is only in authority in certain situations. So mm -hmm. like, absolutely. I may be an authority on a certain aspect of thing in a particular sort of environment, but outside of that, what, what really does that do? This is hypothetical. I am a studio engineer, but let's say I only did live shows for 20 years. I would be an authority on live shows. And at a live show, mm -hmm. I would be in authority because I would be the head engineer, the A1, because I have experience. I am the authority of that situation. When Absolutely. in a studio, if I was a live engineer of 20 years, I would still be an authority on live and that mm -hmm. sort of audio, I would be an authority on live engineering, but I would be in authority in a studio setting because that's not something that I have all that experience with, that title with or whatnot. I'm not the head engineer of the studio. Now, information and authority and knowledge and experience and all that can crosstalk between different things. Very much so. So you can assume that someone who's done 20 years of live sound probably still knows more than someone who's done six months in a studio a year mm -hmm. in a studio, you know, around there. Mm -hmm. But it, you have to kind of think about, okay, just because they're presenting themselves as an authority, just because, and this goes back to how this person in a business suit, they're an authority, but they're not in authority in this situation. So we're going to mm -hmm. break them down into situations and then talk about the authorities inside of those situations in the auto industry. Yeah. Sean, Sean brings up like a really fun, interesting point in like the audio industry. Uh, just a side tangent, the, the live sound engineer versus the studio sound engineer, just such an interesting dynamic because you'd think they would have like, like a ton of similarities between each other and they do have similarities, but there's not a lot of overlap sometimes. I would, I would like the, the live, the live guys, their miking techniques are really damn good. And they've been refined over the years to help circumvent some of the bleed or, or whatever that gets picked up into the microphones. I'm barely thinking about the drums mainly. Mm -hmm. So like, I bet if you were put them in the studio and, and you were like, Hey, mic up a drum kit, it'd be fucking awesome. But then the, but then like Sean said behind the scenes though, is that there are some maybe very foundational studio techniques that the live sound guys might not know, not, might not be put into practice. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm totally side, side tangenting. No, um, you're right. But it's because... just really interesting in, in our, you know, field. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're exactly right. Cause if you think about it, when you're in a studio, there's only a certain amount of headroom you have, especially when the digital domain, mm -hmm. when you clip, you yeah, clip exactly. and it sounds distorted. In a live setting, if you have powerful enough speakers and powerful enough amps, you're never going to hit the threshold of the system. You have way yeah. more headroom than you would in a studio just because that's the nature of life. So you can have a lot mm -hmm. more clear transients, a lot more dynamics versus what you can have in a studio recording, especially due to like the loudness wars and all that, which is a whole thing of itself. Yeah. I, we're gonna, I'm, it is. We're going to start doing some deep dive <laughs> topics that are more about the history and information about the audio industry on our YouTube channel in 2024. So, so go subscribe to that and keep an eye open for it. Those are in the works. But going back on to authority. Yes, go back to our topic at hand. Sorry to sidetrack us. So authority figures in the audio industry. We're going to start with the live setting first. You have the head engineer. You have the venue owner. Mm -hmm. You have promoters. You have band managers. And literally anybody else that kind of comes together and puts together a live show. Mm -hmm. It's a whole team of people. And each one of these people can... Or each one of these people major in their majors. And each, people, each one of these people minor in their minors. Typically... I mean, do you, do you want, how do you want to go through this list real quick, Sean? Well, we're just going to briefly talk about them and then kind of talk about just what it means and like authority in a live sense. Like most of these I wrote down from the perspective of you as the independent artist in, in, in terms of this list. Like these are places where you're going to have to go to, to look for authority. Like if the head engineer tells you to turn down the guitar, you might need to turn down your guitar amp because it's going to mm -hmm. be bleeding in the lead mic or cause feedback or what, whatever, whatever, whatever. These are places in certain situations that, hey, yes, they are an authority figure, especially if they've been doing it for a while. But I do mm -hmm. also want to say that this is true mainly for live. 
when you are a fan or any of your fans come to the show, you become the authority of the venue because they're there to see you. You are the authority figure of, is the night going to go well? Is there a fun Mm -hmm. vibe? Is there energy here? They're looking for you to see how they should react. So if up to you to put on a show and, and, and have a fun time and be emotional and expressive and get them to come up to the stage. Like you are the authority. It's on you. You are performing. But yeah, now that that's been said, we're going to focus more mm-hmm. on as an artist's perspective. These are just basic authority figures that are, are in there. So it's going to be really quick. We're going to scoot through, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to side tangent really quick. First of all, excellent <laughs> point you brought up right there. The head engineer one. It's a very interesting one because this is one that can change, right? So if you go to a venue and they have a front of house guy that runs the show there every night, that's just who they have. That's who they hire. Maybe they're union. I don't I have no idea, but they're just the sound guy and you can't bring your own sound guy. You might view them as being in authority, whereas you could hire your own sound guy who you demonstrate as being an authority, right? You have the trustworthiness, you have the expertise behind the guy that you've hired versus the guy who you're only going to be there for one night. And Mm -hmm. you have to put your trust into him for that night. And you have to go to him for just that one night, that one off time, right? So it's actually kind of interesting that dynamic can change at that specific title. Other than that, usually these generally kind of stay the same. I mean, promoters, band managers can change, yeah. right? The promoters most definitely for sure between venues, between shows, no doubt. But I just wanted to highlight that one really quick because a lot of the time the band is going to be interacting with the, with the front of house guy most of the time. Yeah. And it's interesting that you brought up the whole thing of like bringing your own sound guy versus the house sound guy and in authority or an authority. As someone who's been in that situation multiple times on both sides of it there are Mm -hmm. perks to both yeah you can speak to this well i'm sure yeah if you want the best show possible the best thing you can do is be a mediator between your sound guy and the house sound guy to get them communicating and, and open to working together to get a best show possible because the house sound guy is an authority of the system and the room and the venue. He knows Mm -hmm. what frequencies work, what frequencies don't. He knows how it sounds, how monitor position needs to be, where the feedback spots are, where the reflection things are, what effects work well, how much, how loud it has to be with how much noise is in the room and whatnot. So he's an authority of the room and of the space. There's a lot of value there. The engineer that you bring in is an authority of your band. They know when, Mm -hmm. when solos happen. They know when to boost things, when to cut things, when to use what effects and and that sort of thing. But they don't necessarily know the room as well. So there have been several situations where a house sound guy comes in and it just sounds incredibly compressed, distorted, flat, just not as open as it could be because they don't know the system has a crazy amount of headroom and they're just trying to be safe so that it doesn't peak and cause distortion or, or whatnot or it's really, really bassy because they don't know that this frequency builds up in this this venue. Because mm-hmm. normally they're like, oh, yeah, I put my kick at, and my bass at this point because that's what they're used to in their mix. Yeah, when you start getting insane resonances and exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. if you can foster a kind of communication or friendship between the two and they can work together, you can get some really great sounding stuff. The guy who knows the space and then the guy who knows the the mix. So such a great, that's such a great perspective on it. I, one that I wouldn't have even have thought of myself. I don't do live sound, never done live sound, you know, so definitely not something that I've never really realized before, you know, and how important that can be. But I think this also kind of demonstrates just how perspective based sometimes authority can be depending on who you are, where you are in the positioning of the team. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so like, as we always say, there is, there's gray matter in between the stuff that we say. And, and, and it's very, sometimes depending on who the person is, and where they fall out to be in the event that is occurring. So knowing that moving forward, because that will also kind of stay true to the studio uh, sound engineers as well. So just wanted to throw out that caveat just really quick. For sure, for sure. And and that's just a specific example of how you can have multiple authorities in a live setting. Moving on to the studio setting, you have like the head engineer, the producer, the mic tech, et cetera, anyone who's in the studio to help get a fantastic sound. The same thing happens in this. Intern, whatever. Exactly, Yeah. yeah, yeah. The same thing happens in this situation. You have the head engineer who is the uh, an authority and the authority in the studio. They know what all the preamps do, what all the microphones do, where to put them, how to mic this all up, where the vocal booth sounds like, all that shit. They know all that stuff. But the producer knows what he wants the end result to be. He's got the vision in mm-hmm. his head. 
And this is why when you get amazing engineers and amazing producers in the same room, like Motown, you can, they had just so yeah. many hits. They were literally hits filled because of just that amazing relationship between producer and engineer. And then, mm -hmm. you know, bands went out, they had great talent. They went out and scouted. There's a whole story behind it. But having a collaboration between authority figures that know their strengths and know their weaknesses, that's when you get awesome success and positives. When you have the person who's like, oh no, I know what I'm talking about. You're an idiot. It needs to sound like this. And the engineer's like, I can't get it to sound like that because what you're asking me to do is, is impossible or mm -hmm. whatever it may be. When you have strong things, opinions and personalities that, that butt heads and don't foster working together, that's when you can run into issues where you have hard-headed authority yeah. figures. Ego. Yeah. That's, that's always one of the toughest too is like, especially when you're working with somebody that's like, I want it to sound specifically like this. There are so many different decisions that kind of go into that. And not only that, it's just like, what I, I can't be that other person that was in authority, you know, over the record that you heard. This also goes the same for head engineers, though, at studios, too. There might be a engineer that is maybe unionized. I know Capitol Records, I believe, has unionized um, engineers at their place. So you can't bring an outside engineer in to actually work on the session. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I've heard, at least. I don't know if that's still true these days. But let's say if you went to go record at Capitol Records or whatever um, and use one of their studios, um, you would have to use one of their head engineers or one of their engineers on the roster there, right? And then you have your engineer that you specifically work in, but you just needed to rent out a studio maybe, or you still wanted to bring them along, right? So Sean's offered that suggestion, and honestly, a, a fantastic suggestion in bringing the two together as both being in authority in the studio, just in their own ways. One knows how to get your sound. The other knows how the studio works, like specifically how to use the pre's, how to use the room to its advantage, right? Just a lot of different ways that you can kind of like muster up this authority kind of like matrix that we're kind of building here and, and be able to use it to your creative advantage. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you doing that quick summary for us and like the additions. Yeah, to yeah no problem. Because yeah, authority is kind of an interesting one because honestly, authority is everywhere. You're an authority in certain yeah. regards. It's less, this whole thing isn't saying like you need to be an authority in everything. You need people to do what you do or tell them to do yada, yada, yada. It's just an acknowledging that in certain situations, there are people who you're going to look for the answers to whatever questions mm -hmm. you may have. And it's being able to recognize who is in those positions. Why are they in those positions? Are they worth uh, following the opinions of? And do you maybe know more than them in this certain situations? So mm -hmm. moving on to that, we're going to go into kind of people in positions of authority in a commercial setting. Uh, yeah. This one, the first one's like more of a group, but like labels. Labels have really positioned yeah. themselves as the authority. In fact, up until recently, they were the only option to really get your music out there on a large scale because they had the connections. Massive to, hierarchies. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they had the yeah. connections to radio, uh, to radio stations, to manufacturing plants, all that stuff. They had the budgets to pay for studio time. Yeah, they knew what studios to go to. They knew the people in the indus uh, industry. They've been doing it for a long time. That's like the classic, hey, this is this is the authority in the commercial setting. But this also affects mm -hmm. press outlets like, like the magazine Rolling Stone or any sort of blog, interview, or radio station, or us, podcasts. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a position of authority too. Now, we kind of position this right off the bat that we're still learning. There's yeah. a lot of things we don't know, and we'll kind of dive more mm -hmm. into that later. But the more you do it, the more you learn over time, that just builds authority because you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And then another one they have under commercial that's more new is, is influencers. Now, well, a lot of times influencers and people who create social media aren't necessarily authorities on the music. They are authorities on culture. And this is something that's really important to recognize and utilize and use because they might not have a necessarily authority relationship towards you of, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. going to do what this influencer is doing because it's popular right now. If you really want to just go super commercial, you just chase trends. I don't recommend it. Uh, but if that's what your end up goal is, go for it. But what they can do is they can help turn what you've created into the new trend. So having a strong relationship mm. with people who are in the public eye that can influence their fan base, get your music out there, spread the word of what you're doing. They are authorities on public culture, fashion, just way people share and coerce. Like that is the new influence of sending your shit out there to get other people to hear it. Not a yeah. great way of phrasing well, it. <laughs> it's a great that's a great uh point though never that's something i wouldn't have thought of for sure like being an authority within the culture itself that's we we 
do that all the time, whether we know that or not, right? Mm -hmm. This all also kind of overlaps with social proof, I feel like a little bit, you know, just because we're kind of led to do that, you know, through the actions of others. But there's actually, there's that one person usually, or maybe a couple of people at this point, right, that who's doing a TikTok trend or whatever, you know, that we look towards and we're like, oh, that's cool. Therefore, authority in the culture, right? So great point. Excellent point, dude. I want to move us to maybe educational next. Us, if you consider us in authority. Yeah, this one cool. really is um, us, yeah. We we appreciate it. But like Sean said, like podcasts, informational stuff, courses you buy online. Interestingly, we don't have those written down. College. What do you think, Sean? <laughs> college. Uh, college, is, college is interesting. Yeah, college is interesting because you're going to college to become more authoritative in the long run. Like mm -hmm. you want that credential behind you. You want to learn more. You want to establish yourself in the field, maybe network there. However, the, some of the professors you get along the way, maybe not so authoritative <laughs> in their fields. Kind of whoever did, they just had to hire and run that course sometimes is the case. So that one comes with a big asterisk there. But this is a whole can of worms. I don't think, I think we were pretty much set on the college talk. I mean, unless you have something to add, Sean. I was just going to say whether or not college is an effective authority, like if you should go mm -hmm. there for education, really depends on what the end goal is. Nine times Absolutely. out of 10, because like they're businesses, colleges are businesses. Nine times out of 10, if you're going into a field that you need credentials for, that someone else is going to hire you to put you in a position of authority in that field, mm -hmm. college makes sense. Like if you're going to be a doctor or a yeah, lawyer, or yada, absolutely. yada, yada. Because somebody you else have is, to do that. You have, you have to go to. there. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. someone's going to look at you and say, do you know these things? Yes. No. Yes, you do. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Now you move on to the next set of hiring. But now with all these new courses, like there are courses out there. We took us on recording technology course and in, in me at Schoolcraft and you in Schoolcraft, but also Brandon at Michigan. No one's mm -hmm. going to look at your degree and, and hire you based on that degree. Nope. It's more the portfolio. Nope. So mm -hmm. while yes, you learn technical skills, te debatably, you could have learned as much, if not more, by just doing it. And, and that's that's kind of the gray area of, well, you can learn technical skills, you learn stuff. That really depends on the course, like how good of a system that the college has built, like Lawrence Tech. If you go there for audio, that's honestly fantastic. I personally think because they also have connections where they send people to audio restoration or sports broadcasting mm -hmm. or things like that that are more like, yeah, you know, we kind of need you to know your shit. But a lot of new things I'm seeing are colleges offering courses like, how to be an influencer, how to make it on YouTube. Like they teach yeah. courses for artist development or making the music industry. Come on, come on. You don't know yeah. that. You don't know that. Just yeah. You can buy yeah. a course from someone who has done it, is actively doing it and making it online for a fraction of the price where you get at the minimum a similar degree of education. So yep. That's, yep. that's my quick tangent. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and it's just funny because like our whole entire – the United States itself, I can't speak on other countries, obviously, but the United States itself has built themselves into needing those credentials and those authoritative kind of statements behind the person itself. Like mm -hmm. Sean says, you're going for being becoming a doctor. You want to become a nurse. You want to become a lawyer. You have to go to school for those things. There's no, there's no st skipping, you know, there, you can't go on a creative, creative live and learn how to become a doctor in like three courses, right? You have to have that education behind it. But usually that education behind it is, is bolstered with doctors who have been doing it for a, a really long time, who have been studying medicine for a while, right? Where opposed to these other courses, like Sean just said, like how to be an influencer and things like that. There's no authority there. They're being, they're trying to be in authority rather than being in authority to at that point right and uh, yeah i just wanted to kind of mention the college thing because it's a really interesting dynamic that it kind of plays in our kind of day and age and i know some people are like do i go to school for this do i not go to school for this and it, i mean choice is up to you i'm not an authority in that we just went to school just saying we, yeah. we've been there and we've done that so yeah yeah just want to speak on that really quick while we're mentioning the educational thing because mm -hmm. i know somebody's going to ask about it somebody is for sure for sure if you do decide yeah. you want to go to a college for music, for sound recording, for anything in this industry, how to become an influencer or whatever. One thing that I will say from our experience that has the biggest takeaway, the biggest thing that I've actually learned from doing that shit is do not focus on the education as much, but really try to build connections with the people around you 
who are also doing mm-hmm. it, your other peers that are trying to have the same goal and make a living and do the same thing you're trying to do. Because yeah. the best things I've gotten from my time at college were having a relationship and getting to know Brandon or my friend Joe or my buddy Tyler, who is a session musician who mm-hmm. I hire in sometimes to do stuff. It's those people or my professor Drake, who I recorded the choir with and I learned mic placement for choirs and whatnot. And I've used that a couple of times in a couple of live shows where we've done things like that. And he, my professors still send me students for internships or to talk to or potential jobs or gigs or whatever, just because I had a good relationship with them. So that's mm-hmm. the real focus, not as much so the education Absolutely. in this industry. Yeah. Yeah. Because when the degree totally ends, agree. the college ends, it's the people around you that, and like, it's like, hey, we're going to put a bunch of people in the room who have similar goals with you as you do in a similar age range as you are to learn the same thing. So already, boom, right there, you yeah. know, who around here is as hungry as I am? Who around here is as interested as I am? Let me, let me make friends with them. <laughs> Let's grow together. Great point. Great point, dude. hundred percent. Because you got to learn the stuff anyways, you're taking the classes. Yeah. So you... It, you know, use use the network around you. And that's something that I didn't take it much ad, as much advantage as I should have in college. You know, I did at school craft. I did at school craft. I was I was pretty diligent in that. But when I when I transferred to U of M, which is obviously five, six, seven times bigger than school craft, maybe even bigger than that, right? Probably like bigger. it was just it was very overwhelming, right? And and the classes didn't really amount to the same kind of interactions that I had at school craft, right? So that is definitely ex- it very that's great advice. Great advice, dude. All right, so moving on from college, there are other ways to get educational like knowledge in this industry. One of them, as you mentioned, podcasts. There's us, there's other podcasts like Ari Hirschstan's How to Make the New Music Business, mm-hmm. DIY Musicians Podcast by CD Baby. There's many, many, many more podcasts out so there. Many, oh, so many, yeah. so many. There's tons throw, of YouTube throw videos Throw a pencil, there. you'll hit a course that you can buy, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Oh, yeah, like <laughs> the mastermind thing, the courses you can all buy. There's a ton of YouTubers out there that all talk about artist development and they've been doing it for years. And a lot of them come with um, industry experience that they're now bringing to their own as they shoot off and do their own freelancing sort of deal. So you can look for their credentials in that way. Like what experience do they have? So throw a dart, you're going to hit somebody. If you put in the search terms, SEO is going to help you find someone that has some sort of knowledge to learn what you need to learn. It, it, this is the information age. You can get whatever whatever information. Yeah, it's out there. Unfortunately, you can get whatever information you're looking for, not necessarily the right information or the information you need. So th- that's the only part where it's like, Great point. be you wary just because they've been doing it for a long time is the information they're giving, the information you want to hear or the information you actually mm-hmm. need to hear. So Yeah, because you're going to have to establish the authority of that person sometimes by yourself, right? Mm-hmm. It's just taking that face value, you're going to have to do your research and make sure that you're not getting taken advantage of by some kind of fake kind of authority that they're putting out there. Anybody can write anything on the internet, right? Yeah. So just just be wary that that, that can't happen. That is one of the pitfalls of authority, right, yeah. is, is being putting on that costume that Robert Cialdini talked about. It's the whole guru thing nowadays. Oh, man. Yeah, and it's it's prevalent. <laughs> it's prevalent. One more thing I'm going to say, because we're kind of wrapping up these, there's just examples of authority in the industry before we move on to like what this means for you, how you can use authority and so on and so on. I just want to say a quick danger, just red blinking letters. I'm not going to do this in the video, but just imagine there's red blinking danger <laughs> on the screen right now. In authority, especially in industries like this that are changing all the time, in authority can grow stale. Oftentimes what can happen is people spend the time to learn a skill or learn a trade or uh, develop themselves as an authority. They get to a point where the understanding is, I now know what I'm talking about. Anyone who always says, trust me because I know what I'm talking about, I'm an authority, that is personally a big red flag. That's something that my mentor has really impressed on me throughout my audio journey, is that someone who knows everything stopped knowing anything because Mm. it's so different in some situations. Whenever someone says, oh, I always do this, that's not good because in every situation, that's not the right thing. Like we brought up earlier, if you have your sound guy in a live setting who always turns the kick up and the bass up in this relationship to each other, well, in this venue, it's really boomy, so now it doesn't sound good. But, oh, I always do that. So he just does it and then he moves on to the vocal and he just leaves it there without actually taking the time to go back, listen, learn, see what it does. And this happens all the time in the music industry. This happens with with bands where, oh, I always start with this song or, oh, I always perform this or, oh, I always say this or whatever. It happens with 
engineers, producers, oh, we always have this kind of vocal with these harmonies or whatever. Musically, sometimes bands, when they get a big hit, they try to repl replicate it again and again and again. Just there's something to, to be said about consistency, but also to a degree of the more you know, the less you know. So whenever someone says, I know everything, that's when it's like, okay, that's the first thing to be like, well, do you, <laughs> do you, do you really? Yeah. Yeah. No, I see it a lot in songwriting, honestly, even at, even at like, even the more local level too, it's sometimes the same thing over and over and over again. It's like, okay, at this point, like we're gonna have to try something else, you know? I, I, I mean, I think, I think like what you said, like what, what was it again? When you stop learning, what was it? What did you say again? I, I want to make sure we get that in there because that was like awesome. But it's like when you, uh, when you think you, when you know it all, you stop learning. Yeah, when you something. know it all, you stop learning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's great. I think that's phenomenal. That kind of puts us at the, at the next point of authority. Like what is like kind of all mean, right? We had already kind of mentioned some of these topics at hand, but we're just going to go over them again, just in case people positioning themselves as authorities are, is like, it's everywhere. It's very prominent. Your, your spoon fed authority credentials everywhere. I think he had, I think Dr. Cialdini had mentioned on in the in the chapter is the general hospital doctor don't know what his name is no yeah, idea I. <laughs> but uh, he was he was yeah he was positioned into a commercial where he played a doctor on tv and then he was put into a medicine commercial where he was sponsoring some kind of medicine he said i'm not a doctor and i but i play one on tv right establishes himself as an authority right and that's something that happens a lot right except sometimes we're not given the benefit of him saying i'm not a doctor right people will just put on anything that they want and, mm -hmm. and try to either sell you something or try to bestow their power or knowledge um, upon you, right? So definitely have to be careful. This comes with vetting your information that we kind of talked about before. You have to kind of know and do your research about specific people before you dive head first into what they're talking about and start maybe learning some bad things that they're maybe bestowing or, or you know, you're giving them your money. That that's something too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like just because someone presents themselves as an authority doesn't, doesn't mean that they are. I jokingly yeah. put down us. <laughs> yeah. But also I like mean, we've us, never really, for real. yeah. I mean, we, we have also never really like positioned ourselves as, as authorities on this channel. It's not, it's not how we like to position ourselves, no. right? Yeah. This is just more conver conversation based. We're actively in this industry, learning, trying, doing things all the time. And we just invite you along on the journey to do what we have seen work and talk about it. And as we said, it's a, it's a cabinet of wisdom. You can take the ingredients that you want and cook whatever recipes you need to. These are just a couple Absolutely. of steps and preparation steps and recipes that, that we recommend that we've either done, we've seen done or whatnot. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Anytime that someone is like, Oh, I'm the expert. Do what I do. This is exactly, exactly what you need to do every single time. Everything else you will fail. Once again, as I mentioned, like be, be wary of that. Unless they're like an old grumpy sound guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I only... Sometimes, uh, those, sometimes they, they have some really good points that they bring up and they've done it enough to know like that they're kind of the shit. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that grumpiness comes out of just doing it a lot. Especially sometimes. in this industry. Let's be honest. Musicians yeah. are weird. I'm weird. You're weird. Yeah. I'm uh, weird too. Yeah. Exactly. So if, if you had to deal with uh, musicians every single day for like 40 years, you'd probably be a little grumpy. <laughs> yeah, yeah just just being real <laughs> <Most definitely. Yeah. laughs> no but, oh man but, but so kidding. how can you i mean how can we use this authority right in terms of like being a band being an independent artist how can we use this easiest one low-hanging fruit fashion is probably the easiest one to tackle out of authority we see it every day in the music industry fashion is really important to your appearance to your brand to people themselves so the first thing you can do is take it, take advantage of your fashion statements. You need to, you need to look the part of your band. I think that's like the most clear cut one. Mm -hmm. The best, I, the best example Sean actually came up with was uh, country and wearing flannel, right? Typically those things coincide like peanut butter and jelly, right? Mm -hmm. You need to look the part to play the part, right? Fashion is one of those things that will make that statement. Another example is hip hop, wearing maybe some jewelry, maybe driving some nice cars, right? Another one is rock and roll, living that rock and roll lifestyle, driving a fast car. Hip hop and, you know, rock and roll, they kind of have some overlaps there. But uh, yeah, pyrotechnics, you know, wearing all black. I don't know. It'd come up 
I mean, come up with anything right at that point, depending on what kind of rock and roll you are. That's a side tangent. But yeah, fashion is one of those ways that you can use to establish your authority within your your brand or within your scene. Oh, yeah. I mean, we bring up fashion in pretty much every single one of these influence episodes that we've done. Because, I mean, the, the audio industry, the music industry is a fashion industry through and through because visual is such a component. Even in an audio in- industry, visual aspects are incredibly powerful and important to get people to to pay attention to something. So, like, when we talk about the cars and the jewelry for, for you know, with hip-hop or, like, the, the truck and the flannel and all that for country or, like, the cowboy hats or whatnot, these aren't necessarily, like, you always have to have these all the time, especially if you're just right. starting off without your budget. Don't break the bank. Don't take out a loan for a sports for like a, a Lamborghini or muscle car or whatever, just because it fits the aesthetic, but you don't have have the money for it. Don't don't make bad business decisions or just bad budgeting decisions in general. But mm-hmm. if you can maybe rent one for a day for a music video or at least visually wear things that are within your means that showcase that yes, I am the artist. So the, the big thing is when you walk into a room and you want people to know that you are the one they're there to see, you are the artist, you are presenting in a way where it's like, that's, that's the musician. You need to stand out in that regard. So a lot of things that we mentioned, like, like EDM having LEDs, neon, I mean, you see like, like dead mouse with the big mask or marshmallow with the masks or, you know, all these sorts of things you see them and you're like, yep, that is the performer. There's a really important yep. part of that. And, when you see them, even if they're just in the crowd, you see them as an authority figure because you're there to like you're there to see them. So mm-hmm. that's that's more so what we're talking about in in, in these regards. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I want to make it clear too that like some of these we're being very stereotypical with. Like we acknowledge that a lot of this is what we see sometimes in music videos. Like go find go watch a music video of your favorite artist. Guarantee you they're probably emulating this in some way, shape, or form. You have some exceptions, though. Post Malone probably being the basic, b- biggest exception, right? Mm-hmm. Bro is wearing casual streetwear, and he's he's definitely moved more into maybe the more pop kind of artist at this point in his career. And typically, those two things usually don't kind of coincide a lot of the time. Is is like casual streetwear, kind of woke up through this on. I'm going to go play a show in front of fifty thousand people, and then you're you're very polished a very refined pop music on the back end of things, right? Mm-hmm. All those, you know, he he likes to bridge gaps between hip hop, rock, you know, whatever the case may be, yeah. just make sure that you're fitting the overall aesthetic. You can make your own authority in your own way with this too. So like Sean said, this all kind of t- plays into what you want to do as an artist, but you got to do it well. Oh yeah. And he's developed his own aesthetic more so, as you said, like the casual streetwear, once he hit that level of awareness. Exactly. Now he yep. is an authority based on his music and his credentials, which are going to go over next. Other artists that have done this are artists like Nicki Minaj. I mean, when she wore some crazy ass outfits at the start, and then from there on kind of went into her own style of style when she had that public eye that attention on her to build the authority of mm-hmm. yep i'm in this industry i'm here lady gaga did the same thing with like the meat dress and stuff like that so you yeah, can yeah. either go very far like heavy into what the genre is so that's like yep this person is in the genre they are they are a hip-hop artist so i'm gonna listen to them they are a rock star so i'm gonna listen to them they are an edm artist so i'm gonna listen to them or you can kind of do it like hey i'm so different i'm so in my own branding that it's just interesting. You're intrigued. You want to learn more about them just because of how different mm-hmm. they are. So those are absolutely, but both ways it's fashion and they're using it to build the authority because they have, then they have the eyeballs on them. But as I yep. mentioned, like once you have those credentials, once you have those eyeballs, those can kind of become the main thing that you rely on. And then fashion can kind of become secondary. So talking about credentials next credentials, you can use in multiple situations. You can use them to showcase your authority to your fans you can use them to showcase your authority to to venues, to labels, to radio stations. And those credentials are going to be different for whoever you're trying to showcase it to. Because you can be, as you said, an authority in certain regards, but using it in a place where it makes you in authority is important to have that distinction. For example, you're not going to share Absolutely. your EPK, which we talked about in episode 12, to your fans. They don't need to know what's your average venue size you can fill? Like, can you fill a 200 person venue or a 5,000 person venue? When mm-hmm. you go book a show, they're going to need to know that information. Your, your fans aren't going to need that information. Things like that, like where you've been showcased, what press outlets have covered your music. A radio station is going to want to know that. So they can kind of say that when they promote your song, like, Hey, this song's been played here next live. Go like 
here it is, and they play it on the station. They're going to want to know, but your fans are yep. necessarily going to know that need to know that you uh, were on Rolling Stone and all these other different kinds of press and all these different radio stations and whatnot. So it's once yeah. again po- focusing it to where it, it needs to go. Like we talked about it more in our episode twelve about EPK, as I said, things that you might want to put in your EPK to give those people awards you've won, write ups on your music, how many people you can fit in your venue, your discography, your sales records, merch sales, ticket sales, radio stations you've been played on, bands that you've shared the the, the shows with, like you've opened for this band, you headlined with this band, you shared a show with this group. If it helps you, that's a good credential. If you've got Grammys or things like that, this one kind of does also relate to fans because that's really cool, especially if you won like, uh, hey, the newest, like a uh, best new band or, or shit like that. That does go mm. more into like a fan base relationship, but a lot of these really do focus on within the industry, what credentials are useful in which situations. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Sean took all my bullet points yep. that I was going to go over anyway, so that's fine. No, no. I mean, the last thing that I kind of want to touch on, I think just for this list, I mean, I would go back and try to re-explain what Sean just already explained, but I don't think we need to <laughs> and try to follow up with that. Like I, I, full disclosure, full disclosure, when we do this podcast, I try to make it super conversational. And sometimes I'm just like, I don't know how to make that a conversation because Sean already said it so well, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just, I'm just gonna move on to the next point then. Yeah, move on. But like, as always, as always though, just being consistent and being easy to work with is probably like the best, like, thing that you can do for your authority. This also comes in the way by recommendations through other peers, maybe if they're on the same stage as you or in stage, I mean, just like in the stage of like the business or the career, right? Or people that are, are further ahead of, of you and even per- people that you maybe have maybe moved on from in the past, right? Just always being able to, being able to show up and do what you're going to say it goes a long way with building the trustworthiness. I mean, the saying is what half half of uh, half of life is, is just showing up, right, yep. and and being there and doing it, right. So just be there, just be there, be that trustworthy guy that you can establish that you are going to be in authority whenever you're invited to do something or whenever you're needed to do something and and work with people, right, and make sure that they get a good experience along the way. Don't be an asshole. I think that's probably the easiest thing to say, but always be willing to listen to ideas even if they might clash with yours, right. Yeah. That's not saying don't have like some kind of like solid foundation of like be backboneless, you know, and bend over for people, but you know, make sure that you are listening and taking into consideration of other people's ideas. I think this goes a long way. This isn't really necessarily a symbol of authority, but this is more just like decent advice within the music industry is just being kind of a cool hang to, to be around. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is specifically related to being an authority because going back to earlier, the two things that are required to being an authority is expertise and trustworthiness. Yeah. You can have Sorry, all I meant these symbol, credentials. kind of like a symbol of authority. Oh, yeah. oh, gotcha, mm-hmm. gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Mm-hmm. But everything that uh, Brandon just said, like, yeah, it's the trustworthiness is the part that takes a while to build. That's going to take time. It's hard to buy trustworthiness or earn it or gain it with, with money. It really comes yeah. from experience and going out there and, and doing things. You can go to a college and you can get all the credentials you need. I, you can have a paper that says I have an associate in sound recording technologies. I am a studio engineer. But if there's no experience in it, you haven't worked with bands in the area, you don't have a good space to do it, the credentials don't really mean much. Or if you don't have a strong portfolio, yeah. it doesn't really mean much. It's it becomes like a vanity metric. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's where it becomes a situation like that. It, it, it does yep. nothing but aid in the perceived authority. In fact, there's a lot of authority figures online where you go to, like we said, who have podcasts or are in the industry, like have YouTube videos or whatnot for artist development or things like that. Or for us specifically, there's a lot of engineers out there we see online who do tutorials or teach people how to record or mix or be an engineer who don't really necessarily have that technical expertise. They've just been doing it for a long, long time, doing it again and again and again and keep showing up. And that showcases authority. For example, for us, this is episode 41. So yeah, yeah. So we look at that and like, oh, well, they've done this for 40 other episodes. There are other ones that have over 600 episodes out there. And and that has way more authority than someone who's done it for 40 episodes, if you look at those numbers mm-hmm. on a surface level. Now, if, if you dig in, like let's say we had crazy credentials, that might balance the scales. 
we don't necessarily, we're just always in the industry. We just, it's just part of our job. It's our career. We make a living doing it. That's the most credential that I personally have. I'm not going to speak for Brandon, but showing up. Same. Yeah. But showing up builds that, builds that authority. Once we do hit 52 episodes, that's, that's a full year. When we cross the hundred threat hole, hundred episode threshold, now we're in like a different echelon of podcast. Now it's like, yep. oh, they've got authority. They've, they're doing it. They've shown up for like almost two years at that point. Mm -hmm. And they've been learning and talking about it. it, it it's that validation that is built by the trustworthiness of consistently showing up and doing it and talking about it. I guess the end, end thing I want to say is, is back to what Brandon said. This really does rely and relate to you. If you've been doing this for a long time, if people like working with you and you have good experiences and you've worked at all the venues and you performed all the venues, you've gone to these studios, you know all these engineers, you know all these other bands that you've performed with who have a good relationship with you and they want to see you succeed. All of a sudden, you have a bunch of people who now look at you as an authority because you've done all these things. You've been out there. You've done a bunch of local tours. You've played all the shows. People are going to ask you for, hey, how do, I get a, how do I get a show here? How do I do this? How do I do that? Yada, yada, yada just because you've done it for a long time. And that's mm -hmm. that's really what this whole Music Makers Cookbook is about. It's doing what you love, making music for a long time. It's making a career in the music business. And it's that longevity, that consistency that always, always comes back to it. It always comes back to that. Consistency is key. That's what they say. Yeah. And I totally agree, though. I totally agree. <laughs> Thanks for sitting there and listening is, to my tangent, Brandon. I really appreciate. No, no, you. <laughs> no. That I mean, I mean, well said. It's going to be, be a, honest. Um, it's going to be a mess to edit. I'm going to be cutting out a lot of that shit. Hey, that's okay though. <laughs> that's okay. I mean, really, this this podcast episode has just been us trying to establish our authority and convince ourselves that we are an authority. No, I'm just kidding. Totally joking. <laughs> totally joking. No, I mean, I mean, well said. I mean, consistency is key. If you're trying to beat the statistics that say that you can't do it, there's a lot of statistics saying that you won't do it. And, and being, being ahead of those statistics, right? Like, what is it? The, there's like a podcast statistic that's like, like so many podcasts don't make it past 30 episodes or something like that. This is just some kind of vanity thing, right? That we're, that I'm kind of talking about, but, or, or like most small businesses, small businesses close within the first three years of their operation or something like that. Right. You're, you're trying to beat the odds and, 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 assist, and become sustainable with the longevity of what you want to do and consistency is key. And at, the further you go along with that, the more authority you kind of gain in the long run with it. Yeah. 44% of all podcasts have less than three episodes. According to Amplify and Pod News, most podcasts don't make it past 10 episodes. So in the- That's crazy. Yeah. So, and we talked about that earlier yeah. on about one of our other episodes. So if you want to do a deep dive and look through all the other ones, feel free to do so. <laughs> Please do. Please do. Go listen to us. I, I swear we're getting better. <laughs> <laughs> but no, with that being said, thank you for listening to us on this podcast. Thank you for... Yes, uh, especially with the new format today. Yeah, trying out this new, new way. Let us know uh, how you like it. Let us know what you think. Leave a comment below saying that uh, Brandon's webcam is good or not, depending on your viewpoints of that. You know, if I need it's to change good. anything. <laughs> it's not good. But we're figuring it out. We've got some really exciting stuff coming up. We've got a podcast interview in the works. We're really excited to get that out there once it gets coming. That's going to be happening after we finish this series on influence. So follow mm -hmm. us, keep an ear out for that. Anything you want to say, Brandon, on where people can, can find you and contact you or anything you, you want to yeah. talk about? Yeah. If you need any work done, audio related, anything audio, hit me up on my website, www.studio222recording.com. Or you can find me on any of the social medias, uh, underscore Brandon McLeod, pretty much on every social media. You can find the studio page too on Instagram, studio two, at studio 222 recording. If you just want to say, Hey, too, just reach out, say hello. I'll try to say hello back and maybe we'll talk, we'll talk about something cool. Maybe you like to talk about dogs. I love talking about dogs. So <laughs> he does. He really man. does. I really do. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have one of my pups right next to me. He's, he's laying in his bed right now. He, oh. I thought he was going to make an appearance cause he was laying on the bed, but then he got off and probably mm. cause I was being annoying. So it is what it is. My dogs find me annoying, so. That's okay. Your dogs. Yeah. You know. What about you, Sean? Where can we find some more information about you? Yeah. If you're a uh, folk rock or acoustic artist who wants to have their songs remotely mixed and mastered, you can reach out to me through my website at swsrecordings.com. I also offer one-on-one -on -one artist development coaching, which is a kind of an extension on what we do here at this podcast. Same website. You can check that out. 
If you want to further support this podcast, we have a Instagram, a TikTok, which is close to a thousand followers, a YouTube, and you can fo- listen to us <laughs> on any past platform. So if you'd like to follow us, that would really help us get this out to more people and, and help us grow so we can help more artists and we can get more interviews so we can learn more. That better helps you guys. If there's anyone you'd like us to potentially interview or talk about in the future, give us a message. You can email us at podcast at musicmakerscookbook.com to give your suggestions. Or if you want to be interviewed, you can reach out through that. But really appreciate you for sticking around. Appreciate you supporting us. It allows us to, you know, keep making the living that we are making here and kind of grow and expand. And it's just fun. It's just fucking fun. I like all that. It is fun. It is fun, man. I wouldn't want to do anything else. I definitely wouldn't want to work for somebody who's an authority. (laughs) <laughs> I want to be the authority, not to work for the authority. Tony, man, straight up, straight up PTSD for my past previous well, that, job. <laughs> but with that all being said, respect our authority and... <sighs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Bon appetit. There we go. I was trying to tee up for it. <laughs> <laughs>